Uh, Joe Berkowitz. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. How did that? How did that come about? I mean, we could roll just roll right into it. But like, that's right. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever is good for you. Sure. Um, the uh, Joe Berkowitz and I wrote a book. We had like a, we were like internet acquainted, and we had an idea for a book that was kind of something we were kicking around with a third uh, friend, Nick Douglas, and he was like, "You two should just write this." And the idea was for a um, a fake pickup artist guide, like a satirical pickup artist guide. Um, and it was called, uh, getting it wet, the nice guy's guide to tricking women from friend zone to bone zone. Right. And no one wanted it at all, but we were having, we had a good time writing together and our agent, we have the same literary agent. And he was like, Oh, why don't you try, you know, like, well, I, this one guy really thought you were funny. This one editor, uh, but he would would love for you to take a crack at a different kind of thing. So we, excuse me, they kind of wanted a funny etiquette guide. And so we pitched this book called You Blew It, The Many Ways in Which You've Already, Probably Already Ruined Your Life. Which has uh, just a fantastic title. I could, Thank you. It's very cool. I'm here with Josh Gondelman, uh, who's been kind enough to join me for Way Way TV. Uh, Josh, what would you like? I mean, you work on so many things, but what would, what's like the one thing that you want to tell us about? I mean, the big thing that I'm currently working on is I'm a, uh, I'm the head writer and an executive producer at Jesus and Marrow on Showtime, which I'm very uh, delighted by. And we're back in season, which is really exciting. We we had kind of a long break in between the third season and the fourth season, and now we're kind of back in full force. And then we had to take off another week because um, there were, one of our hosts had COVID, but everyone's okay, and uh, and now we're back at it. I have to say, what I like most about the show is that, the, I mean, my dad always, he's from the Bronx. My mom is from Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like at, I'm at home when I watch Jesus and Mary. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Oh, what a nice thing to hear. Because it's just, this is what we grew up with. Like, like, so uh, that's a breath of fresh air, really. I love all the late night shows. You know, I, I watch all of them, but like just that's something that you really don't find is that thank you is that built into the dna of the show like is that yeah i mean it's it's built into how Jesus and marrow do comedy and perform comedy and, and create comedy i think they are so thoroughly themselves and they're uh growing up in new york is just such a fundamental part of what they do and i think they like to represent you know they it's really important to them to like represent for the bronx and and so it's like it's you know i think sometimes there is a, a real skill and gift to like uh, sometimes a, a television per uh, personality seeming more or less like placeless, like, you know, the way like a, uh, like a weather reporter might try to have that mid Atlantic accent, you know, like a broadcaster accent. But I also think there's like a real joy to people feeling like specifically from a place, even if it makes them less, relatable to people with different experiences. I think it's like really special to have a show with such a um, specific sense of like place and, and origin and, and setting. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the, the writing process behind the show. Uh, sure. So is it, is it very collaborative or is it, uh, do they kind of come in with, with like, this was really good and this was interesting. It's very collaborative. <laughs> I, and I think because they're so improvisational, Jesus and Marrow on set, there is a lot that that is worked over in the edit between like writers, producers, um, and and so so the stuff that gets done in the studio, it's like it's written and then it's improvised upon, and then the stuff that happens outside the studio, right? The remote pieces are like varying degrees of like scripted as well. Like it, one thing I came from last week tonight with John Oliver, where you know he would come into an episode taping and he would know like within 15 seconds how long it would take for him to like deliver the scripted material, watch the, the material, you know, play out the material that is being played for him on, on the monitors and like hold for laughs if he held instead of just, you know, uh, shushing the audience because he didn't have time for them. And so he would know within like 10, 15 seconds how long that taping was going to be. And with Jesus and Marrow, it's it's like a very different experience. And so writing for them is a lot about like giving them input to improvise on 
and knowing what the important pillars are of like, okay, this has to be said as it is in the prompter so that people have the context for it. Or like, we want the outline for this sketch to be this that ties everything together. But in the middle, there's kind of this room to, to play. And so it is like a really interesting experience learning how to be like more adaptive and more, um, the skills of like, helping to impose a shape on segments in the edit sometimes is like a new, not new anymore. I mean, I've been there, this is my fourth season, but it was new to me when I started. Right. And more, more recently you've started to appear on air. Um, I, I've, oh yeah. I occasionally so. they'll, they'll put me in. So how is, how is that? Do you have to, do you feel like you have to switch gears between being a performer and being a writer when you're, when you're asked to come on and, and kind of play yourself? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. Like I'm always kind of thinking about like what they need from what the piece needs from me as like a writer and like improvising on set with them and not wanting to make it all about me, you know, like wanting to like be what I'm be who I'm there to be, but, but stay out of their way and not be like, I'm the third you guys. Right. Like it's, um, just making sure that I'm like playing the role that I'm cast in. So it is, it, there is a lot of it that is, Th always thinking like structurally about what the piece needs for me. Um, but also it's like fun and exercises like an additional muscle to like be a performer, be a performer. That mm -hmm. I first saw you perform years ago back on Conan. Uh, oh yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, like, do you still, now that you're a head writer, do you still have time to do stand up and do you still yeah. get out there? Yeah, I'd love to hear yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm out less aggressively than I was in the past. And part of that is just because my day job, I have more responsibilities and oversight than I did. But I mean, a lot of it is the pandemic still. Like I don't travel as much for shows the last couple of years. I don't um, run around quite as much at night. Uh, you know, I, I try to be a little bit more careful about how long I'm out or how, you know, what, uh, when I'm out and where. And so it, I am, I do pick my spots a little bit more than I had in the past where in the past, I'd just be like, can I physically get there? Great. I'll perform there. And now I'm a, I, you know, a little cheesier. How is your, how is your own creative process changed being the head, being the head writer, as opposed to like last week's item and, you know, going back to even the books? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things about being a head writer that it, it, it is not like you're the the most important writer, it's that uh, it's a lot of managerial responsibilities. So what I really want is to, you know, it's fun to like still pitch some of my own stuff, but I really love the feeling of like helping and, and working with the, the writers we have on staff to like make the stuff that they pitch as robust and clear and fun as it can be. And so that's been like a real exciting new thing this year where like in the past as a, I was a supervising producer and a co-executive producer. So I would like work with the other, you know, I was in the writer's room and had like, I would give some notes on other stuff, but like now it's, it's more supervision and more like, uh, oversight on, on those kind of things. And I'm like really trying to do right by the writers and staff and put them in the best positions to succeed, which is something that I've had to like increasingly think about in a way that is like, a cool, exciting new facet of the job. Do you find that you're doing more coaching and teaching? Yeah. I mean, I, I think teaching, like, I would say that's like a little lofty for what <laughs> I'm doing, but definitely like a little bit more, excuse me, a little bit more coaching, a little bit more like just helping other people, other people's ideas be at their best. So yeah, I think that's like a coaching thing, but it's, it's also like, it's, yeah, it's really interesting because I think that kind of input, I, I, I don't want to have like a super heavy hand with everybody. Like I want to trust people's ideas, but also it's, it like feels very satisfying and like very exciting to be like, oh, I love what you brought to the table here. And I think with just this little tweak or this little flourish, it can be like even more vibrant than it is already. And I think like doing that, not for like the ego reasons of like, oh, I want my fingerprints all over this, but the reasons of like, oh, I think I'm give I'm helping to give your work the best chance to stand up uh, on its own, I, I think is like a really 
cool opportunity. And like our writers are so wonderful and talented and Jesus and Mero are so wonderful and talented. And like, you know, across the, the staff, across the office, there are so many wonderful people that have so much, um, input and, and that is like really great for, for every single piece, whether it's a director or the graphics department or like producers who have an idea for like, oh, what if we presented this this way? And I think that is like so exciting. And, and so for me to get to kind of like help put that into focus a little bit as my job of like, oh, I see where all these different pieces come together on a, on a segment. And I can like, like, oh, let's make sure that everything is the, the clearest, most fully realized version of it as, as somebody who's, who's kind of like looking at it with every other, you know, looking at every facet yeah. as part of my job. Yeah. It's been like really cool. I, and again, it's just such a wonderful staff and I really am lucky to work with such a great team. For, for writers that are watching the show, what, what piece of advice would you give them given like, like the arc of this journey that you've been on from oh, modern gosh. Seinfeld to stand up yeah. on, on stand up on Conan to Jesus Merritt's book? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I think like doing stuff that you're really proud of and interested in is, um, is really important. Like, I think that I, I heard that I, I, I'm sure I've like Xeroxed this quote so many times that I'm <laughs> totally screwing it up. But I, years and years ago, I, I saw Mike Birbiglia do a and a in Cambridge, at least Boston. Um, people from Cambridge will be mad that I said that, but you know, I'm putting it in perspective. Uh, in Cambridge for a bunch of comedians. And one of the things he said was like, basically start from the thing you want to say. And then if the audience like, isn't going to meet you where you are, like take a step towards them and see if they'll come to you now. And I think that that that's like such a, um, a, a clarifying perspective on like, well, do I do it for me or do I do it for them? And it's like, well, you, when you're creating creative work, you want to do the thing that like, feels the most exciting and relevant to you. And then rather than starting with where you think the audience is going to be and just starting there. I, and I always feel like um, when, if you get really good at doing a thing you don't like doing, then kind of the best case scenario for the, the immediate future is people will offer you money to do this thing you don't like doing. So like, I think like get good at the stuff you want to be good at and and that you want to do in the long term and then if you have to take a couple steps off that course that's okay and maybe you maybe you like where you end up going but i think like starting from a position of like this is what i'm really what's really exciting to me is such a um a strong way to start nice what's the best piece of advice you ever got i mean that's that's one of them for sure <laughs> um and i don't know like uh ask, ask what the money is. <laughs> I mean, like, I know that that's not like a creative direction, but I feel like I just kind of said the most like artistic hearted advice that's in me of like, look, do the thing that you love and then find <laughs> either find where to communicate to people or like, you know, extend your arms in their direction and see. And so I feel like that is kind of my like artsy advice, but my <laughs> other advice for people who work in the arts is to be like, what's your budget for this? Um, because I definitely think that like, not that you, not that all your art has to be motivated by money, but I think there are often, oftentimes you will find yourself with people who like want you to do a thing that means a lot to you and that you're really skilled and practiced at. And, and they will not offer that information up front. And it's important. You're allowed to ask. It's not, uh, it's not gauche to be like, will you pay me for my services? And even if when they, even if they go, we don't have a budget and you're still like, well, this is something I really want to do. I'm so excited to do it, to, uh, collaborate with this person or whatever. That's like your choice. Like you have to know what your boundaries are, but to not ask, um, there's another, I guess there's another piece of advice I got from Tony V, who's like a really, really great comedian and actor who I know from, from coming up in Boston. And he said, he said to me one time, you know, they say the only power that we have in this business is to say no. 
And he's like, I disagree because I think there's, it's not just yes or no, but it's like knowing what you're willing to do and what's worth it for you is really important. So it's not just knowing what to like walk away from, but knowing like, oh, you know, it is worth doing for, for this reciprocation or for this benefit, even if it's not something that, even if it's not ideal for me, um, or it's worth doing this up front to get this on the back end. And like, sometimes it's not, but I, I think really thinking to yourself, like, is, is, is it worth it for my creative process? Is it worth it financially? Is it worth it in terms of an experience that I'm really excited to have? It's like a really helpful perspective to have. I agree. Uh, whose work have you, do you think that you enjoy that you think could use a little bit more attention or is not getting the love that, that you think they should? Oh my gosh. That's such a great question. I mean, I, I'm watching Severance on, I guess it's Apple Plus, yeah. which I'm just like floored by. I'm like, holy smokes, what a show. It's so weird and dark and funny and inventive. And I just really, really am loving it. And I'm finding people increasingly, I mean, like selfishly, I just want to talk about it all the time. So I've been just like making people watch it. Um, but I, I think people are, are catching on as the, the finale comes up this week. And then... Um, I'm trying to think there, I mean, there are so many, I'm going to name everybody. That's my yeah. problem is like, I love like search party is another show that I feel like is a little like not unsung. Cause I think people who get it, get it. But I think like, it's one of those things where like more people, like there's five seasons, they've wrapped the series. I think people would really like it if they came to it. It's like dark and weird and funny. And yeah, it's great. Um, in terms of stand up. Gosh, I mean, like, oh, this, I think this is such a slam dunk recommendation. My friend Allison Leiby is about to do a show called, oh God, a show about abortion that she's been working on for the last few years. And she's about to start this big theater run at the Cherry Lane Theater in Manhattan. And I think it's about to be like a really big deal. It's like a really special, exciting show that I think people are going to uh, love. And I hope that like people, it, people catch on right away um and it premieres in like three weeks i think and it's so good that's very cool my last question for you if there was a question that you wish that i had asked what would, sure. what would it have been um oh good question a, qu a meta question yeah, so um i huh i like that you asked what i'm liking um Oh, I guess like, I always wish, like, I feel like people, not you didn't do this, but I think people often gravitate towards like the, um, the like struggle and strain of creative work and like the, the difficulties with it and like controversy in the news. And that's like, you know, I understand why that's compelling, but I think like more people asking about like what the, the fun and exciting parts are about, about working in, you know, in television or stand up or whatever. I think like that's, um, I would always, I'm always excited to talk about that. That's why the show exists <laughs> mm -hmm. or in part, uh, that's all the questions I have. So let me just, where can people find the book? Where can people find you? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I have a book called nice try. So that's kind of, we started kind of right. tangential to this, but I have a book out called nice try stories of the best intentions and mixed results. You can get that wherever you get books, I think still. Um, and I, I read the audiobook If you're an audiobook type person, I'm at Josh Gondelman on Twitter and Instagram, uh, legally too old to be on TikTok, I think. Um, but that's, yeah, that's what I'm up to. And Jesus and Mero Thursdays at 11 on Showtime. I got one more for you about the book specifically. Because I, I had... Yes. So when I read the book, when it had initially come out, uh, I was a former, like, day camp counselor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I just... I, anyone that I come across that, that's been a day camp counselor, I always have to ask them, just if you could just describe your experience. How would you... Yeah. Think? Yeah. I mean, I was so young when I was working at the camp because I was, like, a counselor in training. And then they just kind of, like gave me more authority. I was like, I did like the drama classes while I was, I was probably like 14 or 15. And it was just like trying to stay one step ahead of the kids and like 
keep them focused and to like could pass them off to the next thing and like keep them engaged. And so that was the experience. It was just like every 40 minutes or something cycling through like, okay, how do I get through this 40 minutes? And it was like, in not in like a desperate or sad way, but in like, wow, these kids have so much yes. energy and they really like, if you don't engage them in the project that you want to engage them with, if they're just like, now nah, we don't buy it, it is chaos. <laughs> and so um, that's kind of what it is. It's like a constant uh, attempt to stave off the chaos over and over again throughout the day. Yeah, that's uh, a beautiful summation. Uh, also, my experience. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, I would love to have you back uh, at some point. If, if you have something you would love to plug, you know, sure. drop me a line. And, um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, we are good. To I appreciate it. I'm going to hit stop awesome. on the recording and uh, hang Great. for one second. Uh, yeah, well, it, um, yeah, it's got it uploads. Yeah.